Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to MLA's Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar series. My name's David Brown, and I'm going to be your webinar co-auditor coordinator tonight. Tonight's web webinar is exploring the effect of shearing on prime land growth rate. And it's going to be delivered by uh, uh, Professor Bruce Allworth. Next week, we have a webinar going to be presented by Sandy McEachran. And Sandy's going to be exploring or giving the uh, uh, MLA levy payers of the industry and uh, broader, the broad industry, an indication of where the uh, MLA's uh, lamb uh, definition project is up to and um, helping flesh out you know, what the project is all about and the findings that have been made to date. So that there's a lamb definition project that's been commissioned by MLA and Sandy McEachran of Home Sackett will be giving an update on where that project's at. Next week, uh, that's the webinar next week and the week after that, we also have another webinar um, going to be delivered by Andrew Woods of Independent Commodity Services and we're going to be looking at the, uh, uh, you know, the income from prime land flocks uh, from wool and whether it's cost effective to increase the wool income of prime land flocks. So they're the next two webinars coming up and we hope you can join us for them. You'll be able to see this webinar control panel on the right hand side of your screen now. If you hit that red button, it'll collapse it and reinstate it if you need to. Uh, we can't hear you, but you should be able to hear us and you're welcome to drop any comments, tell us how the weather's going and questions, most importantly in that questions box. And Bruce has kindly offered to uh, stick around for as long as we need to tonight in order to, um, to answer those questions at the end, end of the webinar. So tonight's presenter is Professor Bruce Allworth. I made a mistake, I apologise, it's not Associate Professor, it's a Professor Bruce Allworth. Uh, Bruce, he graduated from Veterinary Science in Sydney University in 1984 and he worked for a fair while in New Zealand at the Massey, Massey University. Uh, Bruce has also worked with the McKinnon Project and is, he owns and operates his sheep and beef cattle consultancy, which is based in southern New South Wales and Victoria for over 25 years now. Uh, Bruce is currently the associate, uh, sorry, once again, Bruce is actually the Professor of Ruminant Health and Production at Walgers Charles Sturt University. And um, he splits his time between this um, and uh, the Fred Morley Centre, he, where he's the director, and running his 10,000 sheep and about 900 Angus cattle. Uh, Bruce is very well equipped to deliver this webinar and um, uh, very, very keen to hear Bruce's opinions and the research that he's done to help solve this issue of whether shearing influences prime land growth rate. With that, I'd like to welcome Bruce to the webinar. Uh, are you there, Bruce? Uh, yes, I am, David. Thank you. And hopefully everyone can see um, the first uh, screen that I've got up there. Perfect. Can do, Bruce. Hear you soon. Excellent. All righty. Well, I'll, I'll start away. Uh, thanks for that introduction, David. And just to, to clarify, I haven't done any specific work on um, shearing on lambs, but I have um, reviewed the uh, work that has been done by others, and that's what I'll be presenting the, this evening. So um, just in case any technology happens or you're very busy and you need to rush off and do something, I've actually got the answer to the webinar on this first slide. And uh, if we take a minute on this, it will probably give you um, what the outcome is going to be. I will actually um, follow through with, with how we've come up with the answer. Um, but this really um, answers the question of does shearing increase growth rates? There's been quite a few reviews on this and uh, quite a lot of research has been published on um, comparing uh, shearing, uh, particularly prime lambs, um, and whether or not there's an increase in growth rate. And the New Zealand Ag Research um, Review in 2012 concluded that the balance of scientific evidence suggests there is no guaranteed effect of shearing on lamb growth. And I think that sums it up very well. I've, I've um, 
uh, answered the question um, with uh, three different terms um, below that um, to say occasionally we do find that there is an increase in growth rate uh, following shearing, but it doesn't happen often and it's certainly not a guarantee. So it's never always. So um, given that, the, the overall conclusion is that uh, in most cases, uh, shearing lambs will not result in an increase in growth rate. Uh, in terms of what we're going to look at this evening, I just want to go through the physiology of what happens to sheep with shearing, um, review the uh, growth rate data uh, when shorn lambs have been compared with woolly lambs, um, and also uh, with and without the presence of grass seeds. And I guess the question I've now turned it round that I'd like to address is, uh, is there, um, are there conditions under which I might get a response um, if I shear my lambs and what are those conditions? In terms of shearing lambs, particularly primary lambs, I'm thinking, but I'm happy for you to add comments and, and uh, in the question time, um, add additional uh, comments on this, but I'm guessing most of us um, consider shearing lambs firstly to hopefully get an increase in growth rate, but also there are management considerations, particularly grass seeds, uh, fly control, and also um, contractual uh, requirements. Um, these days, some of the abattoirs and some of the contracts that um, producers get um, require sheep uh, lambs going in for slaughter to be shorn within a certain period of time. Um, and they might be far more important, in fact, uh, those management issues um, than the growth rate issue in deciding on whether or not you should shear your lambs. So if we have a look at the effect of shearing, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but the, the, the very first thing or the main thing that happens with shearing is that you do get an increase in feed intake. And that is around 40%. It can be higher. It's been recorded as high as about 70% increase in feed intake. Um, and on some occasions, it's been less than 40%. But it averages around 40%, mainly dependent on the prevailing weather conditions post shearing. So the higher rates have been when it's colder, um, and the less responses have been under milder weather. Um, and I've got a graph from one of the trials just there on the right indicating that the response is reasonably rapid, but it doesn't occur immediately. Um, and it's sustained for about four to six weeks. Um, and then it gets back to normal. By the time the sheep is six weeks, we generally consider the feed intake is back to the pre-shearing level. Uh, interestingly, the sheep actually spend less time grazing after shearing, um, but they take in more mouthfuls per hour. And um, that's how they increase their intake. And the net result of this is that it's a less efficient conversion of feed into body weight. And the reason for that is that the extra feed intake um, is not actually designed to make us all money. It's designed to keep the uh, sheep warm. And most, if not all, of the extra feed intake goes in the extra heat that's required to be produced um, following shearing, or as we'll see, the energy required to thermoregulate. Um, and I'll explain that on the next side, slide. The only thing that is not clear is how much the response will be lowered if there are very mild conditions. Um, and most of the work that's been done has simply looked at shearing lambs versus not shearing lambs and waiting a period of about two to four months and then reweighing those animals. And I was hoping that I'd be able to actually analyze the data against the um, weather, but most of the papers haven't reported accurately the weather um, that's occurred. So we can't actually tell um, whether demand varies um, with weather as much as we think. There is an interesting um, outcome from the increased feed intake, and that is that there's no doubt that the animals are eating more and they do have more gut fill. And there has been a, a suggestion that they visually appear fuller. And it is possible that if you weigh sheep two to three weeks after shearing, that it appears they've put on weight, uh, particularly if there's um, excess feed, but it may just be through, um, through increased gut fill, um, particularly if they're on good green pasture. The other thing that we need to consider with shearing is that you do get a depression of appetite when you lock sheep up. 
Um, obviously, if sheep are not feeding during, a, say, a 12-hour period, they're not putting on weight during that 12-hour period. But there's a second effect of locking sheep up, which kicks in after about um, 6 to 12 hours, and that is that as sheep are held off feed for an extended period of time, the time it takes for them to regain their normal appetite um, increases. So sheep that are held off for 12 hours, probably when they come back out of the shed, uh, will resume normal appetite. But if they're held off for 24 hours, it will take them at least another 24 hours to regain their full appetite. Um, so they've actually got two days when they're having um, depressed growth rates. And once they're held more than 24 hours, it goes that increases exponentially. So you do have to be aware of that. Uh, I'm not in any way advocating that you run sheep straight into the shed and expect the shearers to shear them. They will want you to empty them out to some degree, but just be aware that locking up does have a negative effect on growth rates, um, particularly if you're trying to finish um, lambs. Uh, just to... Um, uh, just to go over exactly what's happening with this extra feed, um, the animals operate in a thermoneutral zone, and when they're in that zone, they don't expend any more energy. But if they drop below that zone, they require energy to keep warm. Uh, sheep generally shiver um, is the, the, the usual way. Uh, as a group, they huddle together, but individuals um, shiver, and that uses energy to warm them up. Um, obviously, they generate heat from the, their rumen, um, and if, if they're not generating sufficient to keep them warm and their temperature is, is dropping, their internal temperature, then they will start to shiver and that will use energy. Interestingly, and you might be able to see it on the graph on the right-hand side on this slide, if they are also uh, get too hot, they use energy to keep cool. And for sheep, um, they don't actually... Um, uh, sweat, they generally pant um, and they lose their energy uh, via um, a system in their nostrils and that's how they, they cool themselves down. And interestingly, um, sheep that are shorn that are not provided with shade um, will have trouble with heat uh, on hot days um, because wool is an insulator and so losing that insulation does actually um, result in them getting hotter quicker. Um, which is a little bit counterintuitive because you'd think not having wool on would keep you um, a little bit cooler, but uh, unless there's access to shade, uh, they really don't have the ability to cool down very easily. Um, so the other thing is because the rumen generates um, heat, sheep that are on better feed are already generating more heat. And there's quite an interaction between heat and feed availability uh, it was probably more of interest for this webinar than, than um, really relevant, but it, it is interesting that as you decrease the amount of feed on offer to sheep, that they uh, require more energy to keep warm. Um, the cooling is not such a problem, but they need to start um, keeping warm at a uh, relatively higher temperature. Um, so we do need to consider both the feed availability and, and the weather when we're looking at whether or not we should be, uh, what sort of response we're going to get. Um, so obviously the, the extra energy that they consume by their in, uh, extra intake is mostly taken up by keeping warm or, or cooling down um, and that energy can't be used to uh, for growth. So that's why we don't see such a dramatic uh, response to this uh, fairly dramatic increase in feed intake. And I should just hasten to add there, anyone who's shorn sheep uh, in the middle of winter um, will have noticed that either the sheep lose weight or you need to stock them reasonably lightly because they certainly do uh, consume more feed um, over that next month after shearing. If we just have a bit of a look um, at some of the trials, and there are probably about 28 or 30 trials that have been done um, of varying quality, um, but just to give you a, a bit of a feel um, for the sorts of results, um, there was a, a trial done in New Zealand um, in 2013 and 14 that was reported in 15. Um, the sheep were both on the North Island. There were uh, approximately three mobs of almost 400. One was on the North Island, two were on the South Island. And most of these trials have all had the same protocols. They simply, um, uh, randomly allocate the lambs to two groups and they either shear them or they don't shear them. 
Um, and what they found was that there was absolutely no difference on any of those um, properties on those three trials. Shearing did actually improve the lamb growth rate slightly, but the weight loss that associated from fasting them overnight did not overcome that increased growth rate. So it was only a very small increased growth rate. And the net effect was that those sheep did not, um, um, the shorn sheep were no different to the unshorn sheep in terms of their weight gain. Um, the work done in the 90s at Cowra, um, one of the trials showed um, no difference at all. One of the trials, um, they were interested in barley grass and they had um, sheep shorn or unshorn on barley grass and shorn and unshorn on lucent. The lambs that were on lucent, there was no advantage in the shearing. There was an advantage in the lambs that were on the barley grass and that work concluded that if you're putting lambs on barley grass, you should be shearing them. If you have a look, I've actually put the growth rates grams per day there. I don't think anyone would get too excited at the levels of those growth rates of uh, 77 and 55 grams per day. And I'd suggest that it's possibly the um, uh, a combination of the barley grass and possibly the relatively poor nutrition from the pastures that had barley grass that might have led to um, some sort of difference there. And we can't separate out those two. Um, Again, um, on irrigation, um, some early work that was done between November and February, although they didn't say what sort of pasture it was, found that by shearing lambs, they gained a 2.2 kilogram difference. And if that was the only trial that we had available to us, we'd think, gee, this looks pretty good. Um, uh, and there's not a lot of information that I could gather on that trial um, in terms of the amount of pasture, but given its irrigation, I'm assuming that there was a surplus pasture available. Uh, again, uh, similar work in Rutherglen um, uh, was found no difference just on normal pasture. Again, the period was the, the typical time, December to March. The, the sheep were shorn uh, at the beginning of December and weighed uh, in March, um, and there was no difference in shearing. Um, some work done in the, the late, um, 80s in New Zealand. I uh, didn't look at live weight data, but they actually looked at carcass um, and they found that the uh, shorn lambs actually had a lighter carcass weight. Um, there is a, another trial that actually showed the carcass weight uh, increased slightly, but both trials showed the carcass weights, uh, the carcass composition was slightly leaner from the shearing, which is exactly what you'd expect even during um, moderate uh, climatic conditions. Um, because of the extra draw on the animal uh, and the animal's likely to um, take some fat off. In fact, ironically, um, uh, probably 20 or 30 years ago, people used to shear lambs to um, try and stop them becoming over fat when we used to produce our, um, our fat lambs rather than our larger prime lambs today. And again, recently in the UK, um, I should be able to tell you the breed of sheep of those, but in the UK, they have so many different breeds. This was a triple cross of finishing lambs. Um, they split them up um, 90 and 90, and they found no difference. Interestingly, the shorn lambs took on average eight days longer to finish because they'd actually eaten more of the feed down. They hadn't gained any weight. Um, and so they didn't quite have as much feed on offer and it took them slightly longer to finish. Um, and that was a trial, in fact, where when they looked at the carcasses, that made up a little bit uh, on the carcasses because of the extra time that they'd been on. Um, so that just gives us a bit of a feel. And going back to my original statement, on balance, um, we'd have to say that shearing has little or no effect on lamb growth rates. So um, to answer the question I then posed is, when is shearing likely to be beneficial? Um, the one thing is, if you're not able to control uh, grass seeds on your farm and the lambs are going to be run, running in grass seeds, uh, from a weight gain, there may be an advantage, but there is certainly a strong advantage. And there's been plenty of work, which I haven't presented, in terms of, of skin quality um, for the pelt. Um, and I would um, think that most people would be very comfortable needing to shear lambs if they've got to go on to a heavily grass seed infected area. Um, but hopefully most of you are able to control that, um, but it does get away sometimes. Um, the things that, if we're thinking about shearing lambs and hoping to get a benefit, 
it's we think about the weather conditions and feed availability and the absolute um, given is that really you need uh, excess feed available um, if there's likely to be any benefit um, and that feed needs to be um, in the form of pastoral loosen. They've actually done a number of trials in feedlots um, to see whether or not there's an advantage and all they've recorded in the feedlots is no difference in weight gain but quite a difference in feed costs. Um, that's obviously not going to be much of an issue if if the season's been better than you expected, you've ended up being slightly understocked and there's excess feed available, then you're not going to worry if the lambs eat it if they grow a little bit more. So under those conditions, shearing is, you've got the best chance of it having an effect if at the same time, there is also mild weather conditions. And of course, we all like to think they'll be mild, but um, I, given that it, it, the um, weather conditions um, need to be mild over about a four to five week period. It's fairly hard to guarantee that. Um, and interestingly, even where I could find uh, trials that have been run where it appeared to have excess feed and mild weather, um, it wasn't uh, a guarantee that there'd be a response. So logically, that's the time that you may get a response. But what the trials have all indicated that even under those conditions, you may not get a response. And we've got to just remember that uh, you do need to keep an eye on, on the, the fact that the lambs will be locked up prior, prior to shearing and that may counteract um, any gains that occur. Um, so I suspect the, the feeling that most people have that they do get a response probably comes more from the gut fill and the look of the animals rather than actual weight gain. Just, just a very uh, simple reminder there, obviously, if you um, decide you normally do shear lambs and, and you hear this webinar and you think, well, it may not be worthwhile in my situation, remember uh, to definitely keep an eye on grass seeds. And the other thing is to treat for flies. Um, Cyromazine and dicyclinol uh, are the common ones. Cyromazine is the active ingredient in vetricin and dicyclinol is in click. Um, Obviously, depending when you're planning to market the lambs, uh, if you're not shearing the lambs, then you will have to watch for flies because obviously if you get one or two fly struck, the budget's going to go out the door pretty quickly. Um, so that's uh, something that I'm sure you're all on top of. So uh, what that says is um, the decision in terms of um, whether or not you should be shearing your crossbred lambs, the evidence is that there's going to be little or no growth rate gain. Um, the time again, the time that you're going to get it may be if there's excess feed and the weather stays mild, and then you may get a small gain by shearing sheep. Um, but I wouldn't be making the decision based on the fact that you're going to get a growth rate. I would be deciding to shear the lambs based on looking at the cost of shearing, um, the value of the wool, the penalty for the skin value, and any other issues in terms of management. Um, and I haven't drawn out a table here because it's going to vary for everyone. Um, shearing is going to cost, I mean, it's approximately $3 a sheep, but the actual cost of shearing per head will be 4 to $7, depending on your shed staff situation. Um, shearing lambs um, is relatively straightforward, might be at the lower end, um, the normal shearing. And it might be even less than that if you decide to crutch them instead of shearing. Um, so that's going to decrease that relative cost slightly as well. Um, but you've got to also look at the value of the wool versus the penalty um, that you may get, presuming that you've got grass seeds under control for the skin value, given that usually you get uh, a reasonable skin value, not necessarily the value of the wool, but often more than the value of the wool, less the shearing uh, for the skin value. So you do need to balance that up. Um, and obviously, if you don't shear and you, you um, uh, Add in the fly control. There's a there's a cost there. Uh, I've put ease of management down there. Um, I think we'd all agree that um, um, any time you shear sheep, the uh, the only time you never discuss with a, a client when if they if you want them to change their shearing is about four to six weeks after shearing. Four to six weeks after shearing, we're all happy that we've shorn our sheep beforehand uh, because the sheep are much easier to handle. It's easier to see how they're performing. Um, so that's a, a useful thing in terms of ease of management, but it's not putting dollars on in terms of, of growth rate. 
Um, and the other thing is that I am aware of there's, there's certainly a tendency now for some of the contracts to stipulate that the lambs must be shorn. So if you've got one of those contracts or you're wanting to keep all your options open, then shearing may be necessary to market the lambs. So that's a fairly quick run through, but it's hope, hopefully given you a bit of a feel for the um, issues. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I've just taken the opportunity to um, pop up a couple of slides there as you're getting your, your questions organised. The, um, the awful looking slide in the middle at the bottom um, is just to remind us as we're fattening lambs that it doesn't always go right. Um, and that's red gut, which does occur occasionally on, um, particularly on loosen. Um, it can occur on, on very good clover paddocks, but usually by the time the lambs go on, the clover's not quite as good. Um, and it's actually a physical torsion in in the um, the gut. Um, there's no preventive measure in terms of vaccine or anything. Um, the sheep die very rapidly. Um, the most people overcome it, but not everyone, by by turning the sheep into what they call union sheep, which is five days on and two days off. Um, the loosen, so just giving them a bit of a spell, but it's one of those diseases that they get from too much too quickly. And the other couple of horrible disease slides I've just put in there is is um, just for our um, uh, education to remind us to keep an eye out for foot and mouth, which hopefully we'll never see. So on that note, David, I'll happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, um, a really good overview of shearing and answers up front and the. Uh, and the rationale down the back. So I appreciate that very much. Um, look, just have a have a uh, have a brief rest there, Bruce, and I'll uh, let a few questions roll in there. Um, just a quick reminder that yes, next week uh, I think on Monday night I'll send out plenty of reminders in advance to make sure everyone's on board. But Monday night, Senior McKechnie of Home Sackett is going to be providing a update on where the MLA land definition project is. So specifically looking at what defines a um, uh, what defines a lamb around the uh, the teeth eruption, and and um, whether that definition is going to be rejigged for the industry, and if so, what are the um, what are the implications for the industry? So, Senator McEachern, uh, I suspect at the moment Monday next week at 8 p.m., and um, we're going to be looking at the, the MLA Commission lamb definition project, and we're going to be having another webinar after that, and another well another well, from tonight, another four webinars before Christmas. So keep an eye on your emails and your text messages and hope to see you at those webinars. Don't forget that if you are signing off now, please leave your thoughts and, and comments and um, uh, critique in the post-webinar survey that should pop up. We really do take notice of them and appreciate it every time, uh, irrespective of if you've done it, uh, you know, you've uh, entered your thoughts there for every webinar that you've been to, we keep uh, what, looking at them and um, taking heed of what people are saying. With that, there's a few good questions coming through. Bruce has kindly offered to stick around for as long as we need to get them answered. And um, I'd like to encourage everyone to take an opportunity like we have tonight to, to get those tricky questions answered. So Bruce, oh, I've got a few coming through here. Are you ready to ready to crack on? I'll, I'll give it a go, David. No promises. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, I'll, I'll lead with a question here from Duncan. Uh, Duncan asks, Bruce, in regards to shearing fat lambs in a feedlot situation with lambs on full grain ration, aside from blowing out or feed conversion ratio, could we exacerbate other problems, increase in, in acidosis risk due to increase intake of grain, assuming lambs had minimal time off feed over shearing. Thanks, Duncan. So yeah, great, great question. I, I presume, I presume from that the concern is that by uh, taking the, the sheep off the feed, that um, they're coming back on and getting acidosis. The, the issue is, is it's all about the time that the sheep are off feed. So as they go off the feed, their rumen pH changes, and that's going to lead to changes. Um, and make them more susceptible. Um, but generally speaking, provided those lambs are not off feed for more than 24 hours, there shouldn't be too much issue um, with it in terms of acidosis, uh, provided, of course, they've, they've been uh, on, the, on the grain beforehand. Thanks, Bruce. Bruce, there's a question here um, coming all the way from Southwest Victoria. 
Yeah, it, question is, is there any data to suggest a weight loss in lambs, uh, sorry, a loss in weight loss? Um, I'm just interpreting this. Is there any data to suggest uh, a loss in weight loss with in excess of 12 months of wool? Their lambs are born in August and shorn in November, 15 months later. I think I think we might interpret that as is there any data to suggest uh, you know, weight loss uh, if, the, if it's over 12 months worth of wool? Yeah, look, uh, uh, look the, only, the only thing with, with too much wool uh, within reason um, is um, in terms of wool blindness. There is some information that, uh, that, that shows that if uh, animals are unable to see as easily that their weight gains will go down. But if the, those animals, and in fact, that's what I do with uh, part of our merino lambs in my op operation is they're born in, in uh, August, uh, September, and they're not shorn for the first time until October the following year with about 13 to 14 months of age. And I'm very confident that there's no difference in weight gain than if they'd been shorn on a number of occasions. And with merino lambs, there is a reasonable amount of data looking at different times of shearing merino lambs. The, the difficulty with that, of course, is um, that it's extremely difficult with those lambs not to have reasonably tender wool in them because they've usually gone through one, if not two, stages where the wool's likely to, to um, be fairly tender. Right, yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, Max, <laughs> Max has just left a thank you. A really great webinar. He's got to run. And uh, thank you, Max, for that. Really appreciate it. A uh, quick question here from Rob. Uh, if no response in lamb growth rates, is there any reason why, as rumour has it, shearing will improve reproductive uh, reproductive performance? That's from Rob. Uh, no, the 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 issue on on shearing um, with reproductive performance, um, apart from um, growth rate, is a, per, a perception that the ram's more likely to be able to mate with the ewe when the ewe has a little or no wool. And my understanding is that there's no information on that at all. Um, there is a small amount of data um, that that suggested that a crutched or shorn sheep um, might be it might be better for the ram, but the, it's so difficult to get that data because the numbers you need to do it, um, it's all pretty dicey. So. Uh, for those of you who were un are unlucky enough to have rams ever get out, it doesn't seem to matter what length of wool it is if a ram gets out. And my understanding is, apart from shearing the rams is slightly different, um, but for, in terms of the ewes, um, wool length is not critical for mating. Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Bruce, question here from uh, another David. Um, would these trial results apply uh, to merino lambs as well? Yeah, uh, uh, well, my apologies uh, on on that because what I've I've done I've actually taken out any merino um, uh, trials. Um, the the issue with um, the uh, merino uh, shearing is what the outcome is with the lambs at the far end. So there is no difference in growth rate in the lambs whether they're merino or crossbred in the short term. But what happens with merinos is if you're keeping them on and re-shearing them, then it gets a lot more complicated. Um, and that is because the wool income becomes an important part of it, wool length becomes an important part of it, and micron can become an important part of it. So when you take that all in, it gets a bit more complex, but it, strictly in terms of weight gain, there won't be any difference. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Uh, a fair few factors to consider there. Uh, Bruce, we, you may have addressed this to a certain extent, but Neil's uh, just looking for confirmation. Uh, what about shearing lambs that are going into a feedlot situation? Is it a profitable uh, operation if you're going into a feedlot? So, so the, the, they've specifically looked at that on uh, at least two occasions that I'm, I'm aware of, shearing lambs going into feedlots and they didn't get a response in growth rate. The lambs were no heavier that went in shorn versus unshorn. The reason to shear lambs going into the feedlot will be associated with the management in, within the feedlot um, and potentially the tracking of lambs or the movement of lambs in and out, um, but it won't be associated with the growth rate. So there are a number of reasons. 
Um, if the feedlot gets muddy or, um, you know, things aren't ideal in terms of the feedlot, then having woolly lambs can sometimes get complicated. But particularly for um, just in terms of growth, um, they've specifically done it with feedlot sheep and they didn't get a response, even though they were ad lib feeding. And what they actually found was that the sheep consumed more feed, they didn't get a growth rate response, um, and so they ended up um, being well behind in terms of dollars. Thanks, Bruce. Just for, for my benefit, so that therein lays the issue around feed conversion rate is that basically more energy is used up. Uh, for yes, that that that's the effect. Yeah, that that that's exactly right. She what the effect of shearing is that the animals require more energy, and if you have to pay for that energy, then it's going to be more expensive. If you don't have to pay for it, you might notice it, and it doesn't make any difference. Um, but it's not going to. You're still not going to get an increased growth rate. I I I strongly felt that um, if if you provided mild weather and you gave excess feed, given this feed intake, surely you'd get an advantage. But I think what happens is, as the weather gets milder, that amount of increase in intake decreases. And really the intake is geared by the lamb just to match the weather conditions. And so there's no free kick here that we thought might exist. Right, uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Bruce from Kate, Kate's uh, been a a strong supporter of the webinar series and I think Kate's from up young there uh, it's a technical question but look let's have a crack um, planning to shear the 2017 lambs next week but we'll be doing uh, the scanning of muscle fat and weighing for lamb plan data collection question is should we wait until after muscle scanning to shear these lambs thanks Kate Uh, I'm not quite, uh, I don't know enough about muscle scanning to answer the question. Is the question um, asking whether or not we're going to, there's going to be a, a better outcome for the muscle scanning or I'm not quite sure what that question is there, David, I'm sorry. Yeah, look, Bruce, Kate, you might just, um, if you want to re paraphrase that again, Kate, more than happy to, to look at it um, and uh, we, we can we can do that, no worries at all. Thanks, Kate. Um, it's that David, I, sh I should just I should just say that um, as we answer these questions, I'm sort of saying each time we're not getting a response to um, lamb growth from shearing. The data actually says occasionally we do get a response. So I'm giving the wrong information to everyone by saying you won't ever get a response. Occasionally there will be a response. The difficulty I have is I can't articulate exactly when that response will be. Um, so it's very hard to say you'll get a response. So the fallback position is, well, you're probably not going to get a response. Um, so if somebody's feeling, you know, they've heard the webinar, they've seen all the data, but they're sure they got a response, they may well have got a response because of the uh, six or eight trials there I showed, one definitely had a clear response. So occasionally we get uh, responses to shearing in lamb growth rate, but it's not predictable or repeatable um, which then makes it very hard to advise people on, on how to take action. I hope that makes sense for everyone. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Makes sense to me. Um, uh, Bruce, a, uh, a question around chemicals from John and Helen. They asked, Bruce, do you know any, do, do you know the withholding periods for pelts when using vetricin? Um, it's it's an interesting question. I I understand that the value of the pelts is from them removing the wool, and I would have thought the wool withholding period um, is the appropriate thing. I think the the wool withholding periods on both Vetricin and Click are actually very logical, in that it's a um, a, a, a two month withholding period on Vetricin, and it remains effective for about ten to twelve weeks. And for Click, it's a three-month withholding period, and it remains effective for uh, 14 to 22 weeks. And so, I I would think for most people, unless they suddenly change what they're doing, they would be applying the chemical, and it would probably be without outside the withholding period um, by the time that they're going to be um, selling the lambs. Given that the um, Ironically, the chemical is still being active outside against flies outside its withholding period, which is a pretty neat thing, I think. So um, I don't know whether that answers the question. 
Um, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult one, but I would have thought that if you're um, selling land, if the pelt's worth something, then it's worth something because they're most likely to take the wool off it. But maybe one of the uh, people on the webinar might be able to correct me on that, David. <laughs> no worries, well, maybe. Uh, but presumably the products with a longer efficacy uh, cost more, so it would make sense that you would only apply the product um, with you know that has the uh, tenure of efficacy that you foresee required in your in, on your land. So. Um, yeah, in that exactly. In that instance, yep. well. yeah, they have very short withholding periods in terms of the meat, but the the relevant question is is the pelt. I would have thought. Yeah. So, right yeah. Now, there's a question here from from Casey, and I'm just interpreting. If you have to CRT or crutch plus fly pr treatment, why not shear them? Um, uh, yeah, good, good question. Good, good question. Um, and the the answer is um, only that by shearing them, uh, you may actually, depending on how you're marketing the lambs, you might lose um, something on the skin value. And then it's just a matter of doing the sums. There, that's absolutely right. Now, hopefully, that's what I was pointing out in the other one. I'm I'm not here advocating we shouldn't be shearing lambs. The only discussion we're really having this evening is that don't think that by shearing lambs you're necessarily getting a growth rate response. There are lots of sensible reasons to shear lambs and in in many situations shearing lambs will be a sensible approach. Um, it's just a lot of people think that um, the main reason they're shearing the lambs is the extra growth rate and everything else is on top. I just want you to do the sums and make sure it's appropriate for your enterprise, assuming there's not much uh, gain in growth rate. Um, so that's a really good point, and hence why I included it at the end of the um, the webinar there. Hopefully. Yeah, great. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, Kate has got back to us just uh, with a clarification on her question. Um, Kate's wondering if shearing will affect. This is the lady who's doing um, data collection. Yep. If the shearing will yep. affect data collection for weight in particular in two two weeks' time, um, after all, the, the wool weighs probably a kilogram on the lamb. So it, it's regarding what effect the shearing before or after the um, you know recording of the weight and, and other records for these lambs. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry she got back to us and clarified that. I understand the question very well and I'm not sure I can answer it. The, the Getting weights on sheep, if we're just interested in the weights on sheep, is actually a very difficult thing to be consistent. And when you're putting it in, I, I guess the only important thing is that you're consistent across the animals. Um, the only way to get an accurate weight on animals is a fasted weight. We're not trying to encourage fasted weight in young growing um, lambs. The, the, the way companies always do it is fasted fleece free weight. So the obvious thing would be to shear and then do it a couple of weeks after shearing. The, the thing is that if sheep are locked up for an extended period of time coming into shearing, their weight will of course be lower than if they'd only been locked up for two or three hours. Um, so it depends what you want the weight for. Um, but it is a really vexed question. And in fact, it's one of the things that um, in some of these trials that have been done where they've reweighed lambs very regularly, um, if they reweigh them regularly, they have to do it as fasted weights and then that compromises the growth rate of the lamb. So um, it's something that's not regularly done. So I'm, I, Kate, I'm pretty confident that does not answer your question, I'm sorry, but hopefully it addresses the issue. Thanks, Bruce. Um... Uh, good question here from uh, from John. John asks Bruce, uh, great uh, great talk. Uh, the, your, uh, the trials you presented talk of weight gain. Um, what about fat cover? Yes, so so that it, it's a bit clearer on fat cover. Um, almost um, all the trials that have looked at fat cover indicate that shearing decreases fat cover. Um, so, um, and that is because there is some mobilisation of the fat to get the energy store out for thermoregulation. Um, and that's been reasonably consistent. 
Um, so it depends um, on how long after shearing you're going to be marketing those lambs, but there will be a slight decrease in fat cover. And I'm pretty sure as a result of that, where they've looked at yield, although none of us, not many of if any of us are paid actually on yield, actually slightly increases with shearing, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does, Bruce. Thank you. Spot on. Um, look, the question here from Ross. Ross asks, uh, what about dust affecting long wool lambs in a feedlot situation because uh, woolly lambs look terrible if they get full of dust? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I was, I was just um, very uh, not wanting to really push the fact that when we're not encouraging people not shearing lambs, we're really just encouraging um, people understanding that there mightn't be the growth rate that they thought. And in the feedlot situation, there will be an increase in feed. But you, the, each, each person listening in their own position will be in a much better position to assess whether they need to be shearing lambs or not. And I suspect the answer in a lot of cases is it will be still appropriate or, or will be appropriate to shear lambs. So I think I'm probably um, speaking a bit strongly about the, the weight things rather than looking at the overall shearing of lambs, which will be due to dust. And if you've got a feedlot with dusty conditions, as most of us will have, then um, you're going to lose a fair bit in the wool in any case when you go to shear it. Uh, or sell the lambs, as he's pointed out. So that's absolutely spot on. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, there's a question here from Martin and Sophia. They're uh, a, a great couple who've just entered the industry and they're having a real a real go up at um, up towards Crindai there. Um, and great information, they said, and, but we are new to the industry. And they've been told by their agent and their neighbours, et cetera, sounds like everyone, and they've all advised that shearing is necessary to improve lamb weight gain. And this info that you've presented tonight has absolutely thrown them out completely. Uh, were you of the same mindset, but are you now converted to the notion that this is definitely not the case? Um, I, I'm, I, hope my, I hope my agent isn't listening here. I'm, I'm often told that I should be shearing my lambs. Um, and that advice has gone to many of my clients over the years, um, and I've countered that advice um, and come back with shear the lambs based on the fact that you're not going to get any weight gain. Um, I think the reason people think their weight gain is for several reasons. The earliest work done in the 40s and 50s suggested there might have been a weight gain, and I think that got fairly widely known. I think the animals appear better, and we all see shorn sheep, particularly four to six weeks off shears, look better than any other sheep at any other stage. Um, but the evidence we've got and continue to get and the reason so many trials have been run is that that is what the thinking is, that by shearing the sheep you gain weight. The, the uh, trial in the UK was specifically set up on a group of farms because everyone told them that, that, that they were going to get weight gain and in those 180 lambs they got no weight gain at all. It was exactly the same while the New Zealand Ag Research set up another review of the information to make sure that it wasn't true. Um, and it's probably why this webinar is occurring is because the, inf the scientific information says it's not often that we get weight gain, so it's not something that you can bank your money on by shearing. You should make your decision on shearing based on the fact that you may or may not get any weight gain. Bruce, it sounds like no one wants to believe that it's true. Well, well it, it, it's, um, it is convenient to shear lambs and it is a, a cost and I think all of us who shear lambs wonder, particularly maybe this year might be different, but particularly by the time you've bailed up the wool and paid the shearers, there doesn't seem much there and the cost of the pelt suddenly being dropped down. So you're fairly hopeful that by doing it, even though it's easy to manage the lambs, they're actually heavier as well and you make a bit of money to make up for your effort for doing it. So the reason to shear the lambs is that it's convenient for you to do it, not that you're getting the weight gains. And I'm sorry that's the way the evidence turns out, but that's all I can present. No worries, Bruce. We wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, now, uh, this is a question from Casey, and I, I fear that it may be just a, uh, the same spin on the a different spin on the same the same message here, Bruce. But what about targeting a uh, wool length for skin value? Yeah, abs absolutely. The 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 um, and that's the name of the game. I mean, there are 
um, with very little wool length if you're selling lambs um, and getting nothing versus a fraction more wool length and getting something for those skins, um, it's a fairly fine line. Um, so absolutely, uh, that's one of the things to be considered. So um, I don't know whether that answers the question, but it's certainly an important um, issue. The, the, the real game changer is that, that as far as the abattoirs go, for their um, processing, they would much prefer the shorn lambs. So it will suit them. And some of them I notice are, are only putting out contracts, particularly um, when the grass seeds come on, um, to ensure that they're not getting pelt damage on the grass seeds, that they will only take shorn lambs. Um, and if that progresses, then um, um, that's a very good reason if, if you need to shear your lambs to, to meet the market. Um, but knowing that we're probably not getting a lot of weight gain, that's our only disadvantage. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Bruce, a few people have had to uh, tune out, but they left some positive uh, sentiment. Thanks, David and Bruce. Filled in a really good gap. Another uh, that was from Steve Bunnell. Another great presentation from Tony. Thank you, Tony. Um, very interesting evening from Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Um, uh, Tim, Tim asks, is there any data on cover cones? Yes, there is actually. That's a very good question. Um, there, they've, um, at least three of the trials that I've looked at uh, compared cover combs with traditional shearing and surprisingly found no difference with the cover combs. So there was no advantage in um, cover combs um, did not result in um, better weight gains. Uh, two of those three trials were in colder conditions and one of them was in a milder condition. There will be, obviously, with that, an interaction with weather, um, but uh, cover combs weren't the answer to um, what we're looking at. So that, that is a very good point and I probably should have made that in the webinar. So thank you for bringing that up. The, the other point on all of that, David, is we could have actually turned this presentation on its head and said, well, there's actually no disadvantage in shearing lambs. Um, and it's probably worthwhile remembering that in everyone's mind. I've just said there's no real advantage in shearing lambs, which we're then interpreting is, well, we shouldn't be shearing our lambs. But equally, if you're shearing your lambs, um, and the most interesting trial was that, that uh, one that indicated that the lambs actually grew a little bit more, but it didn't compensate for the locking up. The other way to interpret that information is, if I need to be shearing the lambs, it's convenient for shearing the lambs, I'm not going to be losing anything by shearing the lambs. It's just that unlike what we've been told for years and years, you're not gaining as much as you were hoped for. Well, that might just answer a question that just came in here. Yeah, it was from uh, Scott, who tuned in a little bit late, but Scott actually was worried if he'd get actual weight loss in the winter months. Bruce? Yeah, yeah um, the, uh, the area I didn't, that's a very good point. The, the thing I didn't stress, um, because I was focusing on, on weight gain, is that if you, and I don't think it would occur for many people on this webinar, but if you are shearing sheep in cold conditions, then almost certainly, unless there's absolutely excess feed, the sheep will lose weight. Um, now, that doesn't happen in the prime lambs particularly because we're generally looking at this December to um, uh, February or March period when people, or October through till March when people are looking at shearing them. Um, the difficulty in winter is twofold. One is you've got the extra requirement, but almost certainly you've got decreased, um, you haven't got surplus feed in the winter. And so when animals are shorn in the winter, um, it's quite hard for them to make up that extra um, uh, weight gain. And I don't know whether um, people saw on the graph, but um, if you have less feed on offer, the lamb starts to need to look after its um, thermoregulation at a higher temperature. So it all snowballs pretty quickly in the winter. And I would certainly be, if, if we've got people on the line who are thinking of hanging lambs over and finishing them off in the winter and getting them off, um, if they were thinking of shearing them at some point, I'd be doing it while they still had excess feed and not trying to do it just coming up to sale, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, thank you, Bruce. That's perfect. Uh, Bruce, there's a, a one last quick question here from Nick. And just before I launch into the question, I might it'd be worth mentioning that, and, and, and probably uh, a bit of a laugh that Nick, you, you might not remember, but you actually showed me how to, um, or gave me a few tips on my shearing back in about 2004 or 2005 up in Armidale. And 
Uh, don't take it as a, um, uh, uh, you know, I am hosting webinars now, so my shearing career never really took, took off, but it's definitely not a result of your, uh, the hints you gave me. Um, it's, it's more my, um, yeah, I just wasn't cut out for it, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, So Nick's up in Armidale and he asks if there's, uh, if the withholding period, if there's any issue, oh and s issues for the shearer or uh, chemical re residue in the wool. That's from Nick and Armadale. Uh, yes, a very good question, Nick. There might be other people listening up in Armadale at, uh, at an organisation up there that um, might be interested in anything I say, so I'll have to be fairly careful on that. Um, the, 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 as far as I'm aware, we're not provided with information about oh &S and the backline chemicals. The logical thing, there are a couple of stipulations that people wouldn't do within very short periods of time, but the logical thing is that you would not be wanting to be shearing sheep that have been treated with a chemical that was still within its withholding period um, unless it was absolutely unavoidable, and I'd be worried about oh and &S, um, issues with that. I, I guess uh, things do change and I know how much they can suddenly change and you see the prices and suddenly it hasn't rained and you think those sheep, I, w was, going to, I was going to hang on to them for, for another three months, you suddenly want to sell them. But I would think for most people they're going to be using Betris and on, on prime lambs because of the, the chance that they might be selling them and hopefully that Betris is applied at least eight weeks before um, any shearing. There's still going to be some chemical there, but at that level, it's considered fairly negligible. So that, it, does that dodge the question uh, enough for me to uh, get away with it? It's probably why you're running this um, webinar, David, about shearing because of that early tip she got. <laughs> yeah, no, um, it's uh, no, that's perfect. Thank you, Bruce. Um, yeah. I mean, the, in terms of in terms of chemicals, that they did an enormous amount of work on OPs and the risk in OHS was one of the reasons OPs were banned. As the the new the current chemicals that we're using, uh, just because we don't have OS warnings, OHS warnings doesn't mean that you don't want to be as sensible with all chemicals because eventually they may find something and you don't want to look back and think you've done the wrong thing. So hopefully from both an economic and, and a moral perspective, we're just trying to put these chemicals on when they're effective and by the time they're not effective, they shouldn't be posing a risk. Okay, thank you. So yeah, a few more positive comments here. Bruce, great webinar. Thanks from Jane and Neil. Says this uh, really does blow a few myths in the industry. Big thank you from Neil. Um, and one last comment here from Kate. She says that if they June ram or they shear some rams for their sale in June, and they use a product called Thermoskin, and um, they spray it on to protect them from the cold. So yeah, that's interesting, Kate. Yeah, excellent. Awesome. Right, yeah. well, if there's any pressing last questions, this is your opportunity to ask it, but otherwise uh, that brings us to the end of the question time, Bruce. Excellent. All righty. Well, I hope people have enjoyed that and it's been good. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Bruce, on behalf of the audience. Um, and uh, I can tell by a lot of positive feedback here that it was well appreciated and so the research wasn't in vain and um, I think very well received. Um, and thank you to the audience for providing all their um you know, their feedback and, and participating in the question time as you've done. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Bruce, and um, hopefully we hear you online for another webinar sometime soon. Yeah, pleasure, David. It's certainly the question part I look forward to. It's quite hard delivering them um, blind as we do the webinar, but the questions have been excellent, so that's great. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Bruce. And uh, thank you very much to the audience for supporting the uh, MLA Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar series. Don't forget the next week we're hearing Sam and Kekran on the Lamb Definition Project, giving you an update about where where the state of play is. Um, don't forget to uh, leave a few comments and uh, some critique in the feedback form, and, and keep an eye on your emails and your web and your text messages for any upcoming uh, webinar topics and dates. So. Yeah, thank you very much and thank you very much for MLA for providing the funding to, that makes these webinars of, uh, 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 possible. And um, we're looking forward to catching everyone online very soon. So have a good night.